This movie starts off with 40 seconds of shots of feet, or more specifically, shoes. Also, how did Jason get here? We're not at Camp Crystal Lake, so did he take a plane? Bus? Did he need money, or was he a winner of some sort of Make-A-Wish event? Was he wearing a sack on his head the whole time, or did he just walk around showing his garbage pail kid face? Also, how does he even know where Alice lives? Was he able to sweet talk a public records officer? You get in this house right now! Jeez, I guess Jason was just standing right next to a little kid, and his mom was more concerned about him getting wet than getting killed. Plus, we never hear about this kid again. Probably because he was killed by Pennywise and not Jason, but what's the f***ing point of him being here? A Nightmare on Elm Street on Friday the 13th. Did you know that a young boy drowned? A movie that is 86 minutes steals about half of its runtime from the first movie. It's while watching this fight again and getting an unexpected boner that I pause to reflect what makes a great movie. And I'm pretty sure not rehashing another movie for long stretches is one of the criteria. I mean, this isn't just a simple reminder, this is the whole fight. The ending of the first film never makes clear whether Alice's attack by Jason was a dream or not, which is fine. But showing it here makes it seem like we're supposed to think maybe it actually happened. This is weird because Jason is a clearly grown adult in this film. And then we find out she died two months after this. Also, if this did happen, wouldn't that make Jason some sort of ghost? He looks like he's been in that water for a long time, and he appears to be cut up or some shit. I thought he just drowned, but whatever. If he's a ghost, then the rest of this movie really makes no sense. Furthermore, I'll just say what the first movie's filmmakers said about this movie. If Jason was indeed alive this whole time, why didn't he tell his mom before she went on that murderous rampage? Or is this movie saying that her murders made him rise from the dead? Ma'am, we didn't find any boy. Then he's still there. That's the moment when you wake up startled. I would think you would wake up like that after the attack, but I guess we had to see that final moment of her in the hospital to make this movie even more f***ing confusing. Also, Alice's dreams are f***ed up. She has dreams about things that actually happen, and with better recall than an actual memory. Also, this is a nearly three minute unbroken shot, which would be awesome if it wasn't simply Alice going to the bathroom, talking to her mother, and taking a shower. When they decided to do an unbroken shot, they went with the most mundane part of the movie. Also, this house appears to be pretty small. Where the f*** could Jason possibly be hiding? Friday 2 is using the same POV shots from the first film in a scene where there doesn't need to be a POV shot. If Jason is in front of her here, then I'm pretty sure she's not going to keep casually talking to her mom. After that crazy one take where so much happened, the movie does another 90 second one take where even more happens. Sorry, I think I got so sarcastic with this comment that I don't even know what comparative adjectives I'm supposed to use. Mom. Hello? What exactly startled Alice? That could have been a wrong number. And why wasn't the door locked? Also, who exactly does she think is coming after her? She chopped Mrs. Voorhees' head clean off and was told that there was no one in the lake. But she sure is walking around her house like she knows she's about to get stabbed in the head. Why the hell is this taking so long? We've seen every part of this house so many f***ing times I know more about it than my own. <coughs> yep, might as well get a cat scare in there. We've only got an hour and change left in the movie, but let's just keep padding. Any other cliches out that window? Maybe a trash can that needs to fall over? Also, this is a woman who is torn psychologically by the events of the first movie. So either she keeps a window open, which is unbelievable, or she's not the least bit surprised or scared by a window being open. Also, back to the cat, because this is some bullshit. You're telling me this cat got so scared it leaped through the entire windowsill from the ground? So let me get this straight. Jason must have gotten here while Alice was having incredibly accurate dreams about him, put a head in the fridge, waited for her to wake up, talked to her mom, take a shower, before finally killing her. I guess he also waited for her to see the head, or else he would have had to wait longer under the table or the pantry or the fourth dimension where he came from. Gotta hand it to Jason. Even though he's a mass killer, he's polite and takes the tea off the stove when it's ready. You gotta love the opening credits that credit the actress whose character just died and bill her with some other asshole in the movie. Sorry, Adrian. Your role in the first movie and death in the second movie is worth exactly one co-credit. Apparently audiences love this awful character from the first movie and demanded that he return. Also, does anyone else think they should have made Ralph the killer in this film? We know a sh** ton more about him than we do Jason. Okay, let's call Ted. If you needed to use the phone, why didn't you just park by the phone booth? Yeah, okay. Okay, give me the directions. This was the same problem from the first movie. People coming out to this town with no idea of where to go. How does this guy not already have directions to the place if he knew how to get to the town? It's also his truck can get towed, I guess. They didn't believe me. You're all doomed. You're all doomed. How does Ralph even know that Jeff and Sandra are there to go to the camp? Welcome to God's country. <laughs> so this asshole played a prank on his buddies, but how did he know they would stop in front of the package store and run to a phone booth to call it? Or was this how they planned it? Hey guys, when you get to town, be sure to stop and call me. Then I'll give you extra directions. Talk, talk, jokes about old times, blah, blah. Seriously, does anything happen in these movies before the 45 minute mark? Where did this sucker come from? Maybe a tree? There's a few of those surrounding you. How the f*** did Jason know there would be people coming out to the lake today? Does he tap phones? Why didn't Jason just kill them here? He seems to be building suspense for the unseen audience, rather than for his raging killing boner. 
Scenes like this and Crazy Ralph's phone booth run-in makes me think they were still going for the same murder mystery angle they used in the first one, but we know it's Jason. They don't even hide it in the trailer for the film, so I'm not sure why any of this red herring bullshit is needed. It's like trying to paint Andy as the killer in the first child's play. It's great to have you all here at our new counselor training center. Wait a minute, so why did Jason single out Jeff, Ted, and Sandra on the way up here? You mean the other camp counselors got to drive on the road without a tree branch blocking their way, but those guys are somehow special? Also, what the f is a camp counselor training center? I promise you, I'll never ever be late again in my entire life. I'm glad that the movie had time to go through all the bullshit about Jenny being late. I'm sure her lateness will affect the entire movie somehow. Jenny, put your car in the lot, okay? This place is starting to look like a Burger King. Paul says this, despite Ginny's car being the only one visible in this area. Among other things, this is bear country. And contrary to what everybody hears, bears are dangerous. Do you mean there was some sort of misinformation back in 1981 about f***ing bears? Was Smokey the Bear such an icon that people thought he spoke for all bears, even though he was just a dude in a costume? Also, bears are mentioned so many times in these Friday the 13th movies, it's a real shame that we never get a good bear scare. Keep clean during your menstrual cycle. Things that would never be said in a movie made past 1989 for 100, Alex. Use a little of that child psychology you're majoring in. Paul's subtle foreshadowing line foreshadows so hard that I went blind looking directly at it without special glasses. Try it. What did you do? All you did was look at the engine. You didn't do anything. You don't even have any tools in your hands. I don't want to scare anyone, but I'm going to give it to you straight about Jason. Even though he's not currently connected to any murders, but his mother sure as f*** was. His body was never recovered from the lake after he drowned. But that was 20 years ago, so he's probably not a threat. Anyway, back to his mom. The girl who survived that night at Camp Blood, that Friday the 13th, she claimed she saw him. But of course, she's a goddamn liar, because she was never in any position to see him. In fact, now that I think about it, why did she assume that was Jason out there? Nothing supernatural happened in the first movie until that very moment. So the idea of a dead kid coming out of the water to drown her would have been far-fetched, even after what she experienced. <coughs> I really f***ing hate Ted. Well, I think I've got you. Check. Look, I'm not expecting this dillweed who trains camp counselors to be Bobby Fisher, but for f***'s sake, how does he miss that Jenny's queen is in the direct path of his checking knight? Wrong, white man. That's racist. Checkmate. Indeed, it is checkmate, but I'd like to know how the f*** his king got halfway up the board and he never used his rooks? Is there any way Paul gets into the cabin while Ginny was right at the door? Sure, her back was turned, but Paul's chess game makes me believe he wouldn't be the best at sneaking into a cabin without making noise, and he wouldn't be able to anticipate Ginny looking in only one direction. Uh, Paul, uh, there's something I think I should tell you. We never find out what Ginny needs to tell Ted, but I swear to God there was a pregnancy subplot in this movie. Talk about menstrual cycles, lectures about being late, the maternal sympathy Ginny shows toward Jason later, her getting pissed at Paul for not understanding that dynamic, but we never hear about this again. Where the hell is Jason? He's either hanging upside down from what looks like a pretty small tree, or he's nine feet tall. It's more, if Jason's intent was to kill Paul or Ginny tonight, he didn't go through with it. So he must have known Crazy Ralph would be peeping by the tree, or else this tree killing makes no sense. Dead dog, hot dog. Muffin? Terry appears to be looking directly at whoever is looking at her, so how does she not see them? I just store my chainsaw here in the linen closet. What are you kids doing out here? This dedicated cop somehow walked through the leaves without making one fucking sound. You're gonna have to keep your people away from that place, Holt. It's condemned. Next time I catch anybody over there, I'm gonna have to run them in. Why is Camp Crystal Lake so off limits? To the point that there's a cop roving the streets looking for trespassers and giving warnings. Yes, Mrs. Voorhees killed a lot of people there, but nothing has happened for five years. It's almost like the cops know that Jason is a thing, when nobody knows that Jason is a thing. Five years this guy's been patrolling these woods, and this is the first time he's ever seen a six-foot-tall, kill-happy psychopath running around. I guess Jason was pupating in a well-concealed cocoon for five years. And that's after the 20 years living like a Loch Ness Monster in Camp Crystal Lake. A full minute of running. So did no one know this place existed? Also, it's been five years and Jason hasn't killed anyone. There haven't been some curious hikers. Well, at least we know where Jason takes a sh Glad this movie chooses to answer the really important questions. Also, why doesn't the sheriff at least have his gun pulled at this point? Between this and Scream 2, I'm starting to think that all slashers are smart enough to go to towns where the dumbest cops ever are employed. Okay, who else? We only have two cars. You only have two cars? How the f*** did everyone get there? I think I'll stay too. Muffin may show. This nipples girl nipples doesn't nipples seem nipples to nipples worried nipples about nipples her nipples dog nipples being nipples gone nipples for nipple hours. I guess cleaning up meant grabbing the flag, but not picking up any of the dishes and food left on the tables. Way to follow Paul's strict rules on bear prevention. Muffin? Looks like Terry went to the Nicholas Cage in Wicker Man School of thinking every little noise is whoever you're looking for. Well, my dog has been missing for several hours, so I guess it's time to skinny dip in the lake. Looking for something? I'm going to sin 1981 for this being acceptable behavior in a movie. 
I guess we can trace this kind of thing back to Animal House, really, but f*** you, 1981. This is where we keep the dirty towels. The woodland fairy puts it in the washer, and the garden gnomes dry it with their peppermint schnapps breath. There's a fully stocked kitchen just a few feet away, but Terry instead goes to a room to look for a knife. It only takes 50 minutes for our first camp counselor, <clears throat> I mean, camp counselor in training to die. God damn, I hate this dude. End of sin. You know, two of our kids got holed in today. It's weird to me that Ted refers to them as two of our kids. Aren't Sandra and Jeff his friends? They're the ones who called him at the beginning of the movie, and they drove together to the campsite. So isn't it weird you're referring to them as if they're your employees? He's got holed in today. It was five years ago, some girl, I don't know, panics and falls out of a canoe. And a bunch of people were killed by some deranged mother, but, you know, semantics. He must have seen his mother get killed, and all just because she loved him. I mean, isn't that what her revenge is all about? Her sense of loss? While Ginny is 100% correct, there's nothing in this world that should make this sound like rational thought. In one breath, Ginny says Jason saw his mother get killed because she was mad that he died. Think about that for a second. I thought they went to go f 10 minutes ago. What took them so long? Three goals you're gonna lose. I've heard that one before. Huh. You have? That seems like a very random thing to have been told before. Where did that car come from? Paul specifically said they only had two cars. Okay, where the f*** was Jason? There were shots of Mark from the front, and there was no one behind him. For whatever reason, Jason decides to bury his machete into Mark's skull and never tries to get it back. What this really illustrates is this camp's dire need to put in wheelchair ramps. Ah yes, Jason knew he wouldn't need the machete anymore because he knew there was a spear he could use later. Also, do we really need these establishing shots of Jason walking into the cabin and going up the stairs? I can totally buy that Jason knows how to use stairs to get to Jeff and Sandra. Also, am I the only one that thinks that Ted's mask would be way creepier in future installments than the hockey mask? <laughs> Holy f how awesome is this spear? It went through two bodies, a mattress, and maybe even a box spring. I'm gonna get a ride home with you, okay? Okay. You mean f***ing Ted stays behind and gets to survive? F*** this movie. Are there any after hours places around here? Sure are. Sure are. What the f*** is this scene? What the f***ing f***? Okay, so Vicky is still alive, which is cool. But I'm wondering why Jason sat here looking at her, but decided, nah, I'll kill Mark first. I think it's possible we've seen more people walk up these stairs than we've seen get killed. Sandra? Jeff? Don't mind me, guys. We all have urges. I'm just looking for the guy who was supposed to do me. If you're naked, that's cool. Nothing I haven't seen before. Great jump scare, but was Jason just lying there the whole time waiting for someone to come check on Jeff and Sandra? And did he just assume they wouldn't see Jeff propped up by the wall? Also, is there any reason why she isn't running the hell out of there right now? While Jason takes 10 years to kill Vicky and she does nothing to get away from him, I'd like Jason to explain why he holds knives and machetes with the opposite end up. I guess it's supposed to be scarier, but this is supposedly the guy who takes Manhattan later. I don't think Manhattan socialites caught into this kind of thing. What is this, a joke? I mean, I told him the whole bears no menstrual cycles thing. Kitchen light's still on. Must... Must be the main fuse again. And the bed full of blood, that's probably a circuit breaker. Also, if the main fuse is out, then why is the kitchen light still on? Oh, there's someone in this fucking room! Jason was a mastermind until this very moment. This is a guy who can predict everyone's movements and kill like no one else. But in this scene, he makes a lame attempt to jump out of the shadows and totally whiffs on killing Paul. Watch your boyfriend wrestle with a psychopath expert, but wouldn't Ginny be doing more than just saying Paul very calmly while he fights for his life? Come on, come on, come on. Sure, we were given some foreshadowing of this event, but that doesn't make it any less of a car won't start in a horror movie cliche. Also, she should do what Paul did and stare at the engine for two seconds, because sometimes all a car needs is a steely gaze. First off, Jason slams his pitchfork into the middle of the car roof, a location where no driver has ever sat in the history of cars. Second off, why did he even bother with this? Couldn't he just do this through the window? And third off, this reminds me he had a perfectly good spear a minute ago. He obviously removed the spear from the bed and the two bodies he stabbed, so where did that weapon go? Ginny lightly kicks Jason, and he goes sprawling, and he's incapacitated until she can escape. Instead of doing any more running, Ginny's bright idea is to wait until Jason is again within kicking distance to do the thing she should have been doing anyway. The rat from Mission Impossible and The Departed makes a cameo here, once again giving zero f**ks about how ridiculous his appearance at this very moment is. Wait a minute, I sense pee behind me. Jason somehow stood on this chair holding a pitchfork and Ginny didn't hear it. Given that the chair breaks this easily, there's no way it didn't creak like a motherfucker when he stood upon it. And man, he really could have used that bed stabbing spear. I'm in love with that spear. This is why you keep your chainsaw in the linen closet, as this movie expertly showed us earlier. You never know when you'll need it around the house. This is a great final girl sequence. I almost want to remove one synth, 
then there was that whole urine thing that just happened, and I can't get past it. Oh my god. Please help me! Ginny could have run I don't know how many directions in the woods, and she still ends up at the shack. Also, does this look like a place anyone would live that would in any way be remotely helpful? You've done your job well, and Mommy is pleased. This works. But if this is all it took for Jason to figure out that Ginny was not his dead mom reincarnated, then I have trouble believing why he fell for this ruse in the first place. Ginny! This is Paul X Machina, so sure, we'll sin that. But did Jason just knock Paul unconscious during the fight and leave? That is not Jason's M.O., but sure works out for the movie's sake. <laughs> it is said that from this one scene, Zack Snyder was born. I'll be back, but don't let them ever put me in space. Jesus. Paul enjoys kicking a man while he's down. Do they even need to open this door? If it really is Jason, f him. Let him try to get through the door. You have weapons to kill him if necessary, so why facilitate his entry? What the f Was Muffin buried in the pet cemetery? Or do you mean to tell me that a dog that looked exactly like Muffin got killed when we saw that awful dog corpse earlier? Also, it's good to see Muffin alive. F that other dog. Funny, Jason without his mask looks exactly like Michael Myers. That's so weird. So which part of that was a dream and which part wasn't? Are Paul and Muffin dead? Did Ginny even survive? Is someone going to make me watch part three? So many questions and so many answers I don't care about. You're looking at your claws and you're looking at your fangs. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't know what to do, man. I don't know how to kill the bunny. With this, you don't know how to kill the bunny. Ever since Cinema Sins began, the most requested thing has been TV Sins. And now it's a reality. <gasps> Click the link in the description below to check it out. And now, the audio outtakes. You! Lobo, bring back Sheriff Lobo. Lobo, Lobo! Well, I think I've got you. Check. I got some new luggage for our trip up to Earth. Let's fuck to celebrate. And I... This place is spooky. Be afraid. Be very afraid. I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Oh! Where's my penis? Where's my penis? And that and... boy wants me. Ah! Wolfman's gone. No. <gasps>